In 1912, he was the US Open champion for the second year. He won it at Buffalo. And he went over to Muirfield, one of the most famous courses in the world, and certainly one of the most famous courses in the Open Championship. And he was strongly fancied. In those days, you had 36 hole qualifiers before you got into the tournament proper. He shot 91. He couldn't adapt at all. He played poorly. He was upset. He was angry. This 91 had people over there laughing at him, including Germans who were quite happy to see him fail because of the fact that he was seen already as being a sort of a cocky guy who was going to put the British players in their place. The following year, in 1913, before Brookline, he played in the Open Championship at Hoylake, near Liverpool. And he played well, he finished fifth. And at that stage, that was the best ever showing by an American player. And in those days, you've got to remember, you had to get a boat journey to cross the Atlantic and get yourself prepared. And he was well prepared on both occasions, but the first one, awful. The second one, not bad at all. Hi, this is Rich Weil from Somers, New York, and I play at the Mohansic Golf Course. Brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com, this is Golf Smarter number 847. A U.S. Open history lesson that will surprise you, despite what you've seen in the movies, with author Kevin Kenny. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Kevin. Hello, Fred. Nice to meet you. It's great to have you on the show. I'm so happy that this book was recommended to me um, by a, a good friend. And um, it's a fascinating story that most golf fans probably aren't aware of, uh, when, and that is the first American, how do they say, the first American homebred hero. Oh, yes, exactly, yes. Yeah, uh, to, to win the U.S. Open. And that's why we're doing that this week is because the U.S. Oh. Open's coming up. Um, it's, it's a time for a history lesson. Introduce us, please, if you will, to John McDermott. Well, he's, uh, he was from uh, Philadelphia, uh, of Irish-American stock, father a mailman, and um, he started his life in uh, golf by catting at Aronimic which is one of um, America's most uh, famous golf courses, host of uh, major championships, both professional and amateur. And he learned the game by caddying there. And then at a relatively young age of about uh, 17, he turned professional. That was the, the norm, uh, I think, for... Uh, that was the norm uh, for the way. You've got to remember at these times that uh, a lot of people saw uh, um, golf professionals in that era as caddies or maybe slightly better than caddies uh, and it was only very very few people that sort of achieved sort of uh, a more significant place in society than that so he came through the ranks uh, but he clearly had uh, clearly had talent and um, he started out uh, by playing in the US Open um, uh, but it was really the years between 1910 to 1913 that he became an extremely famous and successful player. I'm going to stop you for a moment because I want to uh, dig in a little bit. Uh, when you said he turned professional at age 17, um, what yes. what is that in 19? Uh, what what year was 19? What year was he born? Uh, he was born. Uh, well, he was 19. He was born in about 18, I think 1891, 92, around that uh, year, around that time. Yeah. Okay. So. In, in, in 1910, yeah. um, what does it mean to be turned professional in golf? It's a good question because there was no formal, uh, uh, there was no formal uh, path into it. You just said, I'm going to become a professional and I'm <laughs> going to make from uh, teaching or selling clubs. That was it. Uh, so you, you graduated from the caddy yard usually and you just said, I'm going to, and you tried to get somebody to give you a job as an assistant, which he did. Uh, and that that um, that got him on his his path. And at, up to that moment, um, how old uh, was golf in the United States? When when did golf get going in the United States? Well, professional golf and golf generally, but the eighteen nineties, last okay. decade. So of, of it was a the, relatively new sport. 
relatively new, and most of the, uh, the certainly in the professional world, most of the big hitters in golf uh, uh, came from Britain, mostly Scotland. I want to say the big hitters, the players, the course designers like Donald Ross, uh, not exclusively, but an awful lot of the, uh, if you can call them elites of that time, they came across from Scotland to, uh, to earn a living. They knew that the game was beginning to blossom in America. There were opportunities. America was a relatively wealthy, uh, powerful country at that stage. And golf was beginning to take off. And, of course, they dominated uh, golf uh, for the first 10, 15 years in terms of establishing golf clubs, in terms of designing courses, and particularly in terms of playing. And that's why before um, John McDermott won the, the US Open for the first time in 1911, no... American born player was dominated by mostly Scots and a few uh, English professionals who had come over to to make a living. And this is all pre World War One. Absolutely, right? yeah. Pre World War One, and, yes. And, and but they're seeing this, so there was an attraction to come to the United States to play golf um, as teachers, not as a, a touring professional well, well, competitor. Really a tour as such. There was the U S open and maybe a few other tournaments, but there was, they were teaching. There were also a lot of challenge matches at that time where pros would challenge each other. You know, they'd, they'd uh, maybe get a, somebody to put, to put up a purse, uh, for a challenge match. There'd be bets on it, that type of, uh, thing. But the main attraction was to get a good club to get one of the more prestigious clubs. And if you had a Scottish accent, it helped. <laughs> Is that right? No, no doubt about it. And the newspapers commented on that a lot about the Scottish brogue or the Scotch brogue, as the Americans might, journalists might have called it, that if you had the Scotch brogue, you had a better chance. It, it automatically meant this guy knows something about golf. Interesting. So, and, and McDermott resented this terribly. He felt that they were being treated, the American pros were being treated as inferior species by the imports. Now, some of that may have been uh, not true, but there was also some there was some truth in it as well. So mm -hmm. there was a little divide between the, the homebreds and the imports. But definitely being uh, uh, an import helped you get get along in professional golf at that time. Fascinating. And these challenge matches were they noticed by anybody? Was there and was it was it like well, the horse races where you're just like, oh, let's go out and watch the horses and bet on the horses? Yeah, they would know that they would have been set up. There would have been quite a, quite an anticipation about them, uh, you know, in, in in the various clubs that uh, they were played in. The, 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 the one one pro would challenge another, uh, or two pros would challenge another uh, to another two in a four ball. Being noticed, they would have got a little bit of coverage in the press because I say there weren't an awful lot of tournaments to report on. But uh, John McDermott, when he came on the scene, uh, even when he was he was young, he uh, before he was known, he was challenging people for $500, which was a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. This would have been about 1909, 1910. He was throwing down the gold and say, I'll take on, in the Philadelphia area, and said, take on anyone for $500. I don't know where he got the money. But uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it, it's not recorded. Maybe he had the, the, some backers. But he was he was very very good uh, at at that very very confident in his own ability. And when we back up a full century, and you say yeah. it was covered in the press, um, yeah. it's hard for us to fathom what the fr the press was in the early 1900s versus the early 2000s, uh, where well, we had yeah, complete yeah, coverage then, 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 all over the world, everywhere yeah, instantaneously. Very, very yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the newspapers, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, local newspapers, they would pick up on these uh, matches. They would hear about them. They would report. You'd get a few lines in the paper. Now, nothing like the U.S. Open. That was the big one. That got proper coverage, uh, you know, day by day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the challenge matches, they would just, uh, uh, somebody would hear about it or phone in about it and so on. And uh, they would get, get a few lines in the paper. It would get your name, maybe a, a small headline. Hmm. Um but McDermott was very, very confident in his own, and he was a very good money player hmm. with his own money. And, and so uh, the Open Championship, which we call the British Open, yes. um, we do over here, the, yes, uh, that, that was well established at that point, right? Oh, that Had the, the, the that Open Championship well. been around for a while? Oh, absolutely. Ryan, Ryan McDermott's time was around for, for what, uh, 40, 50 years. Uh, that was, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that was well, well established. Um, but, uh, the, the, but the US Open, that was, the, the, I suppose, the one where McDermott uh, uh, 
that's where he really featured. But uh, the British Open was around a long, long time before that. Do you have any sense of when the U.S. Open began and how uh, its origins? Um, well, I, I'm not sure who started it, uh, but I think the first uh, U.S. Open was uh, around about, I can check it if you like. Uh, yeah. It, it was about um, 1891, I think. Uh, let's see. Just about the time that, uh, that McDermott was born. 1895, I beg your pardon. Okay, 1895. 1895. So he was a little kid. He was, and, he was where, about years old. and was that in the Philadelphia area? No, I don't know. I'm not quite sure where the first one was. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I can check it if you like, but it, it started in 1895, won by an Englishman called Horace Rollins. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. That was just a few, McDermott was just a few years old uh, when, that's, when that started. Right. And so for the first 15, 20 years uh, of the U.S. Open, it was always dominated by Brits or Scots. First 16 years, it was always a, a, a British uh, or a Scot well, an English or a Scottish uh, winner. Free English, yeah, yeah. Mostly Scots. All right. Well, let's talk yeah. more about this um, and, and uh, who, who uh, John McDermott was. Um, yes. versus who we think he was. But we're going to take a quick time out, and we'll be right back after this. This episode of the Golf Smarter Podcast is brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com, home of the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. Let's talk about the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. Actually, it's my favorite rangefinder, and it has all the premium features you need, like slope technology, an 800-yard range, and flagpole lock vibrating sensor. Yet, it's a fraction of the cost of all the overpriced rangefinders out there. And it's so easy to use. Just raise the rangefinder to your eye and find the pin. The eagle eye will automatically lock onto the target, even like me if you have shaky hands. And then it will vibrate when the laser has locked onto the pin. I have to tell you, this is my favorite feature because over the years I've used a lot of different rangefinders and I've always had the same problem with each of them. I couldn't get a clear reading because my hands were shaking while I was trying to focus on it. With my Eagle Eye rangefinder, I just click once and it locks on the target every time. Now, here's the best part. Usually the Eagle Eye rangefinder retails for $259.97. However, We've put together a special 50% off deal for Golf Smarter listeners. That means you can get the Eagle Eye Rangefinder right now for the ridiculously low price of only $129. Just go to mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter. Again, that's mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter. Or click on the link at golfsmarter.com. And I'll also put the link in today's show notes. However, I do need to warn you that this is a limited time deal and it won't last long. So go to mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter and secure your range finder while you still can. Kevin, I think that most people when you, if they're golf historians at all, and you say who won the very first U.S. Open. Who's the first American-born golfer to win the U.S. Open? The name Francis Wimet would probably come up to most people. For sure. And, and of course Wimet won it in what, what was it? He won it a couple years in a row. 1913. But that wasn't the first one. It was John McDermott. John McDermott was the, was the first one two years before. Uh, in 1910, John McDermott tied for the U.S. Open. Uh, in a playoff with two Scottish brothers, the Smith brothers, Alex uh, Smith and McDonald Smith. Um, and he lost in the playoff. And then in 1911, he won it in the playoff. And in 1912, he won it uh, again. So for three years, over 72 holes, nobody beat his score. And then it was Francis we met then in 1913, as you say, who, who won maybe the most famous or one of the most famous US Opens of all time. And that was the one at Brookline, right? I was when, one of Brookline, immortalized in, in, in book and in, uh, by Walt Disney movies as well. The greatest yeah. game ever played. 
So why so, is why is it that John McDermott is getting slighted? Why isn't his story um, that compelling? I think there, there are a few reasons. First of all, um, if we start in 1913 and work backwards, um, Francis we met was a caddy. He was a caddy boy from Boston, but he beat Harry Varden and Ted Ray in a playoff. He was completely unknown, and he beat these two giants of the game uh, in a playoff and uh, literally put golf in America onto the front pages. Also, he was a very, very charming, respectful, nice guy, whereas McDermott, uh, who had won the previous two Opens, was fiery, some people said cocky, and uh, had attitude, as we'll probably talk about later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and his attitude boiled to the surface famously in 1913, uh, before just before the Bookline uh, U.S. Open. So I think those reasons, the, the personalities of two, but also the fact that we met was this completely unknown caddy, and the fact that he beat Varden and Ray, who were two. They, it was one thing for an American boy, born guy, to win the U.S. Open, but to to beat the British who were the superior, it was their game after all, uh, to beat the British at their own game was just something unheard. We gave the country a tremendous lift. And whereas McDermott's career sadly tapered away, uh, but Francis we, we met became this great figure in American golf. In American life, he had a postage stamp dedicated to him and many other honours. Unbelievable. So, so wait, when, when uh, McDermott won in 1910, or actually when he tied in 1910 with the Smith brothers, they weren't yes. Americans, were they? They were Scottish from uh, up around Carnoustie yeah. Way on the east coast of Scotland, yeah. And so what was he building up the excitement? Was, it, was McDermott building up the yeah. excitement for those three years and then just disappeared? Well, he, he disappeared. Uh, I'm not sure what... what uh, Chronologically, chronologically, rather, which way you want to, to do this? I mean, he he came on the scene really in 1910 at the Philadelphia Cricket Club, and he tied the mm -hmm. Smith brothers, mm -hmm. and people began to take interest because he was he too was a caddy, but he was he was a professional as well, and there was a certain amount of snobbery. I think if uh, you know, for being honest about it, I think uh, a lot of the public and probably the media as well they preferred a, an amateur caddy to a professional ex-caddy, or an ex-caddy, now professional. Uh, mm. So he, he, but the, the media were, were definitely getting interest, interested in him at this stage. They were beginning to talk with this caddy boy. He was only he was only 19 when he won his first US Open. So, um, you know, it, 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 quite remarkable. But uh, he was building up excitement. The newspapers gave him very, very good coverage when he won his two US Opens in a row, but nothing like what followed when Francis, we, we met one it. Why and do you think thing, it is uh, that that is it just because the the path that he took that he said I want to be a professional and he was kind of cocky about it or did the press you know, not like him? They they liked him. He was very good copy, but they also deep down a lot of them felt that he was a bit too cocky. You know, he was um, uh -huh. he had this famous run in with Ted Ray and Harry Varden just the week before the U.S. Open of nineteen thirteen. And he was he was pilloried, and I think his, maybe his career was never quite the same after that. Was he uh, the year that Wimet beat Ted Ray and Harry Varden in 1913? Was McDermott a factor in that uh, that championship? Well, this is it's a very interesting question. Um, the week before the uh, the U.S. Open at at, at, at Brookline, um, the week before there was a tournament at. Delaware, Shawnee on Delaware, and McDermott, Vernon and Ray were playing in it, and McDermott beat them out of sight. And afterwards, he um, he basically told them that uh, he rubbed it in and said, hey, you know, just so as you know, you're not going to take the U.S. Open trophy back with you because I'm going to beat you. And everybody thought it was deeply insulting to these two giants of the game to talk to them in this way. And it created an, the most, it was a diplomatic incident, you know, letters flying backwards and forwards from both sides of the Atlantic. And at one stage, the USGA, who sided with Varden and Ray and the establishment, and they were talking about stopping McDermott from playing in, 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 in at Brookline. But in the event he played, and actually he played quite well, he, he only finished four shots behind four shots out of a playoff. So it was a good defence of his title. Uh, so 
he was almost a factor. Four shots in professional golf over 72 holes is not a lot. Uh, so um, he, he put up a good show. But the effect that it had on him, the amount of abuse that he got, some of it self-inflicted, uh, but the amount of criticism that he received, I think it, it marked him. He was a fairly paranoid type of guy anyway. Uh, so uh, as we'll probably see later on, if we want to talk about his health issues or mental health issues rather, but it, a lot of people would feel that uh, that was a big turning point. But he was very young, remember, he was only, what was he, about 22 at the time, you know, so, but there were no allowances made for that. And how old were uh, Ray and Varden at that time? Oh, they would have been uh, well into their, uh, well into their 30s. They were uh, experienced uh, 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 players, open championships and the rest, you know what I mean? These were massive figures in golf. But it was more the fact that he was seen as being disrespectful to the masters of the game. And the USGA, the US Golfing Association, did not like that. They, and they, 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 they reprimanded him as he was rebuked by the media, by just about everybody. I don't, he, he hardly had. The funny thing about it was that actually himself and we met got on well. The day after the, 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 the when the, the 72 holes ended, um, there was a playoff, this famous playoff between Varden, we met, and, uh, and, and Ted Ray. And McDermott stayed behind to encourage we met give him some advice beforehand. He was so determined that the trophy stayed <laughs> in America as opposed to across the Atlantic. So he gave him some advice and we met always recognised that. So they got on fine. Hmm. You know, the, it could be, a, people might have imagined that there was a sort of an animosity there. It doesn't look like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matsumura was a very generous guy, but McDermott was also quite generous to we met and he acknowledged that by staying behind, as I say, to support him in the playoff. Interesting. Hmm. Um, was the USGA established at this point in the early yes, 1900s? Well, yeah, yeah, that was established. I'm not sure of the exact date, but it would have been established in the last decade of the uh, the, uh, the, the the 20th century, 1890s. Okay, and were there, was there no, is... no PGA at that time? There was no Professional Golfers Association. That didn't start in 1916. So the oh. USGA, it's, well, it still runs the US Open, but it really basically ran golf. So there was no PGA, in a sense, to even defend McDermott, just stick up from. Uh, so <laughs> he was pretty much at home. <laughs> um, and were there established uh, events uh, every year like this, or was it really just the U.S. Number, Open number, and the Open Championship at that point? No, there were a number of tournaments. Uh, and it's good that you asked that, because an awful lot of people have said that after Brookline, McDermott's career was finished. In fact, uh, a month afterwards, he won the Western Open, which was a very, that had been going for a number of years. And that was after the US Open. That was the next most prestigious event. And he won that. So that was uh, a very, very big event. The Philadelphia Open, which he won three times, that was another event. There was the Metropolitan Open. Uh, There was always a tournament down in Pinehurst in North Carolina. So there was, um, you know, maybe six, seven, eight tournaments. And then you had the, the challenge matches that I spoke of. But there wasn't a tour. There was nothing like the PGA Tour that began in the 1930s. That hadn't, that hadn't happened yet. All right. There's so much more that I want to learn about John McDermott. Um, uh, and and what you alluded to mental health issues, but also what it was like to be a professional golfer. And we're going to do that right after this. This episode is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. And with two majors down, next up, Brookline. Now, from tee to green, get in on all the action with DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can deposit $25 or more and get $100 of free bets instantly. So who do you think will be able to tame the country club this weekend? Is it going to be Brooks, Scotty, Justin Thomas? Will Rory be able to roar back and win two weeks in a row? Well, not all the big names will be there, but this is for a major And those who chose to play in an exhibition match won't be competing against the absolute best in the world. Now, it's easy. Just pick six golfers, stay under the salary cap, and lock your lineup before the pros hit the first hole on Thursday. Everyone can play for over $10 million in prizes. Don't miss the action for golf's third major. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code GOLFSMARTER at sign up 
deposit $25 or more, and get $100 in free bets instantly. That's code GOLFSMARTER, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See notes for details. Now, if you or someone you know has a gambling problem, crisis counseling and referral services can be accessed by calling 1-800-GAMBLER. That's 1-800-426-2537 in Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Or 1-800-NEXT-STEP in Arizona. That's 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado and New Hampshire. 888-789-7777 888-789-7777 or visit http ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. 1-877-770-STOP. That's 7867 in Louisiana. 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text HOPE NY. 467369 in New York. Visit opgr.org in Oregon or call text Tennessee Redline 1 800 889 9789 in Tennessee or 1 888 532 3500 in Virginia. 21 years and older or 18 years and older in Wyoming. Physically present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming only. New customers only. Minimum $25 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply and product offerings may vary by state. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Kevin, I'm fascinated uh, about uh, about the, you know, what it took to be a professional golfer at this time uh, and to compete on a regular basis, but there wasn't a lot of money. I mean, like there was no sponsorship money here. Um, and you, if you won $500, that was a tremendous amount of money at that time. But how long did that last considering you had to cover all your travel expenses and you had to cover all, everything? Well, the first prize for the U S open, both U S opens at McDermott won. that was $300. That was the first prize. Wow. But there, there were, there were some add-ons <clears throat> in the sense that, uh, <clears throat> one, it could um, help you get a good club job. Two, <clears throat> and McDermott did this successfully for a while anyway, you could design your own clubs. The clubs then were handmade rather than factory made. And he was very, very good. He learned, he was a club maker as well as everything else. So basically that was it. You you know made some money on the golf course. You made some money from challenge matches uh, and, and tournaments. You made some money from teaching and then you made some money from club making. And if you were successful, like he was, then it was, you know, quite the thing to say I, my clubs were made by the U.S. Open champion. So that was it. Not a huge amount of money, but th- there was something there. Interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah. And he did uh, McDermott end up competing overseas as well? Did he go after titles uh, at the Open Championship? Good, 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 good question. Now, um, in... 1912, he was the U.S. Open champion for the second year. He won it at Buffalo, uh, New, New York. And he went over to Muirfield, one of the most famous courses in the world and certainly one of the most famous courses in the Open Championship roster. And um, he was strongly fancied. And the qualifying, in those days you had 36-hole qualifiers before you got into the uh, tournament proper. He shot 91 in the first round. Uh, he, he couldn't adapt at all. He played poorly. He was upset. He was angry. He improved in the second round. I think he had an 81 in the second round. But this 91 had people over there laughing at him, and including Germans who were quite happy to see him fail because of the fact that he was seen already as being a sort of a cocky guy who was going to put the, the British players in their place. And he shot 91 in the first round. And then he, um, uh, I wouldn't say... In fact, he played in the French Open the following week and played well. I think he finished fourth or fifth. The following year, in 1913, the year of Brookline, before Brookline, um, he played in the Open Championship at Hoylake near Liverpool. And he played well. He finished fifth. And at that stage, that was the best ever showing by an American player. So he had two goes at the uh, Open Championship as a competitor. One awful and one quite respectable. But he, he was very determined. And in those days, you've got to remember, you had to get a boat journey uh, to uh, whatever length, length of time it, t- it took to cross the Atlantic and get yourself prepared. And he was well prepared on both occasions. But the first one, awful. The second one, not bad at all. 
but he was keen. He was one of the first to sort of say, yes, I'm one of the first American. And he was sponsored for those things. Just when you mentioned about the money, there was actually a, a collection made from uh, by local, uh, um, certainly the Boston uh, and Philadelphia golf associations, I think, uh, business people, etc., etc. They collected money just to send him on his way to pay for the trip because that would have been an expensive trip. Going for you had to go for about a month between traveling there and back and getting some practice rounds in beforehand and so on. Okay, so the word sponsorship existed, but it was a very yeah. different beast. Very different, exactly, exactly. Interesting. Um, mm. you, did you mention Germans didn't like him? Uh, uh, did, no, some journalists. Oh, journalists. I'm sorry. I think I said Germans. Maybe my Irish accent is is hard. No, no, that's okay. No, it's my lack of Irish hearing. Yeah, they thought he was good copy because he was always in the news, either because he was playing well or because he might have had an argument with somebody or other. But they also were a little bit suspicious of that, but they liked him because he he sold newspapers. And they they played up the boy caddy uh, angle quite a bit. And had uh, you said he played in the French Open? So uh, in the French, on the way back from the from the Open Championship at uh, at Muirfield, uh, the a, a group of him him and some of his colleagues from America who had gone over there to compete as well. They played in the French uh, Open, won by a local French player called uh, forgotten his name, but he, he won. But he played quite respectably there. That was on the way back. Mm-hmm. So golf went. East before it came out west, right? I mean, it it traveled through Europe uh, after well, its in inception. France always, France always had a tradition for golf, going mm. you know right back to sort of the same time as America. Uh, Americans took it up. Uh, France okay. had a for for the elites, I would have thought, uh, but they had a tradition of golf. Further east than that, no, it wasn't like in certainly in Central Eastern Europe. The, the, you, you wouldn't have had golf at that stage. I see. I see. Um, I'm fascinated. What drew you to this story? I have a, a good friend in Florida, a man called Marty Cavanaugh. He's um, he's a PGA professional, Hall of Fame member, and um, I met him a few times when I was over in the United States researching, and we, we, we emailed from time to time, and he talked to me about John McDermott, and he said to me, because I, I, I'd written you know, three books on American golf history. And he said to me, you know, that guy, he said he was really badly treated. Uh, And he said, it's really a shame that he's not in the Hall of Fame and all of this. And he said, you know, there's a story there. And I said, "Ah, I'm not so sure. Uh, But anyway, (laughs) I thought, let's do it. And I did it. So that's really what got me. An interest in in American golf history, uh, which I've always had. And secondly, then the fact that Marty was prompt to me and uh, I I got down to it then. So that's it. And... And where am I speaking to you today? Where are you today? I'm in Dublin. In You're in Dublin, Dublin, Ireland. Right, the capital of Ireland on the East Coast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and, and you've written other golf books, golf history I, books. I've written three golf history books, one about uh, American golf during the Great Depression. I've written a biography of Ralph Guldall, who won the U.S. Open two consecutive years, uh, 1937, 1938, then he won the Masters the next year. He was the best player in the world. And then within three or four years, he lost his game. And uh, I've written a, a, a bio of Patty Berg, one of the great women golfers and promoters of women's golf, one of the founders of the LPGA Tour that now is this mega million uh, business, if you like. And she was a pioneer. That's the name of the book, Pioneer Champion of Women's Golf. So that's the three. And this is the fourth. But you clearly up. have a fascination with an Ameri- with yeah. American golfers. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> so much of it, so many stories <laughs> that you can play, so many different angles, so many wonderful players, just so much going on there. Yeah, fascinating. It's my hobby. Mm. It's your hobby. <laughs> it's written yeah. what four books, and it's your hobby. When, when I wrote a book about Ralph Guldall, uh, he was from Texas, from Dallas. I um, I emailed Ben Crenshaw's office, two-time master champion, and asked him if he would consider maybe writing a testimonial or whatever, which he very kindly agreed to do. And his agent, uh, I think it was his agent, or certainly his friend, who I was using as an intermediary, said, what in God's name is a guy 
uh, in Dublin writing a book about Ralph Goldolf in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> so, so there we are. So I suppose it is a bit, it is a bit strange, but as I say, it's a hobby. <laughs> Oh, wow. All right. Well, we're speaking with author Kevin Kenny, who is written. He's fascinated by American golf from Dublin, and he's from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, and, but we're going to talk more about his book, Golf's Forgotten Hero, The Life of John McDermott, as we approach the U.S. Open, the very first homebred, American homebred hero to win, win the U.S. Open on the week of the U.S. Open. And we're going to be back right after this. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, we talked to Craig Sigal of Break80Golf.com on how you can achieve lower scores without practicing. Here's the easiest, simplest thing in the world. As part of your pre-shot routine, you have an idea or a trigger to smile. I'm going to smile 18 times today. That's my main goal. All sports psychologists talk about process goals. Have ones that contribute to your emotional framework for the day. Emotions are there for a reason. Your unconscious mind lets you know whether or not you are or are not living to your values and your beliefs. So if your value out there for playing golf is to score only, then if you don't, you're going to get difficult emotions. What if you start the round with my goal, my belief, my value right now is to enjoy the heck out of myself. You're out there to enjoy the sun. You're out there to enjoy the grass, the feel of a crisp stroke coming right off the center of a five iron if you're out there in the course thinking that come on can you just see how your game is going to be better that's golf smarter mulligans episode 163 featuring craig sigal so please along with your subscription to golf smarter subscribe to golf smarter mulligans the best of the golf smarter archives that are no longer available on any podcast app published every friday from wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts So John McDermott's path was unique. Uh, yes. He ruffled some feathers along the way because of his confidence and arrogance yes. and cockiness. Um, yes. But he also, he also backed it up by winning. Oh, he could play. Um, and he could play. Uh, yes. He won the U.S. Open two years in a row. And That's then cool. Francis Wamet wins the next... Yes. A U.S. Open, again, beating the masters of the game, uh, Ted Ray and Harry Varden. Uh, yes. But what happened then to John McDermott? He well, kind it, of disappeared from the conversation. Yes. I mean, in, in, if, you, if you go up to 1913, where he was still very much a feature, even though uh, he didn't win the U.S. Open, make it a hat trick, uh, but he won the Western Open, and he was still very much a feature. But um, after that... Uh, gradually uh, mental health problems began to take over his life and um, he, um, he, he he more or less withdrew or was withdrawn from uh, from from life and he ended up in um, it, well with uh, I suppose I think what was called or what is called a big pardon schizophrenia that's what it was diagnosed with but uh, he was, he was assigned to an asylum in Pennsylvania called Morristown because he had a breakdown. Uh, that may be a simplistic way of putting it, of calling it, because I'm sure it was far more complex than that. But from all the evidence available, uh, he, um, he had a, a, a form of breakdown and was diagnosed uh, as being uh, schizophrenic. Now, what caused the breakdown? Uh, there are various reports on that. Um, he made some investments apparently around about 1913 when he had accumulated a decent amount of money for the time. Apparently they went uh, badly for him. Uh, but he also had uh, got some serious issues uh, of, uh, as I say, paranoia, which uh, as I understand was one of the symptoms of, 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 uh, uh, of schizophrenia. Um, but uh, he felt that people were out to get him. He felt the USGA were after him because of what happened just prior to the US Open when they were considering banning him. He felt he was misunderstood. And um, basically from 1916 onwards, he lived the rest of his days up to 1971 in an institution. 
And it's interesting that the the PGA of America was formed in 1916, and at the very, very first meeting uh, in New York, uh, a collection was made for John McDermott. And to be fair to his fellow professionals like Gene Sarazen and Walter Hagen, they organised testimonial matches for him to, to, to raise some funds to help him with the upkeep in, in the sanatorium. Um, uh, Sarazen, Hagen, uh, Johnny Farrell, uh, Irish-American professional, won the US Open uh, in the 1920s. Uh, so there was a fair amount of support. And they never, Walter Hagen visited him at Norristown. They never forget the fact that he was the first he opened the gates for them. He was the first one that gave the the U.S. professionals the confidence. Before McDermott, no homebred American had won uh, the U.S. Open. After his second victory, the next five were won by Americans. Now, that's hardly coincidence. So the, there was a sort of a, a, a pioneering element to him. Uh, I don't know if he was aware of that at the time, but the other pros recognised what he had done. So his life was spent um, in the sanatorium, fairly benign existence, his sisters, Gertrude and Alice, come to visit him. Uh, he Sometimes he'd go out and play a few holes of golf at a local club where, he, you know, people were... He was very quiet, very unassuming. It's funny because he was this very, very cocky figure, some would say, but then and later on he would come to a club. There was no fanfare. He wasn't sort of turning up, in a, you know, expecting everybody to... Uh, you know, to, to to roll out the red carpet for him. He just wanted to play a few holes and uh, stay in touch with the game. And he would go to uh, watch if there was a golf tournament in the area. He would um, he would go to watch it. But he died then in 1971 peacefully, just after the U.S. Open at Marion in uh, Philadelphia, uh, where Lee Trevino beat uh, beat Jack Nicklaus in a playoff. He was at that U.S. Open. Uh, so that was a life. It was a long time to spend in a sanatorium. 1916 to 1971, long, long time. Uh, the book that I've written about him, as I, as I say, uh, the, the it's beyond the remit of the book for me, uh, a layman, to offer a medical analysis of what happened to him. But uh, certainly the the, the 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 loss of investments. One other thing, uh, Fred, that I must mention actually that I think possibly affected him too would affect many of us. Um, in 19 uh, 1914. 1914, uh, he went to try and play in the Open Championship. This was his last attempt. Uh, at uh, in, He was in uh, over in Prestwick on the west coast of Scotland. He failed to show because he misjudged his time and he was disqualified. He accepted mm. the grace. He said, no, he said, no, no excuse. They wanted to make some sort of an exception for him because of who he was. He said, no, I, I messed up here. My, my mistake. And on the way back, he was getting a, uh, in the English Channel, the ship he was sailing on was struck by a British ship, an accident, of course. And he spent the best part of 12 or 15 hours in a lifeboat. And I think for a guy who was in a fairly fragile uh, state of mind, this could have been a terrible shock, as you can imagine. So that didn't help as well. Uh, and that might have contributed to the to the mental illness too. So he was lucky wow. to survive that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, so and then was, he had to go play in golf after that, going through that. Well, he went to America after that. He, this was on the way home. He was supposed to play in the Open at oh. Prestwick, uh, but missed his time because he was late for whatever reason. I travel see. missed judgments or something. But on the way home, uh, he was on this. I think it was a German ship uh, sailing back to America, and he, they were struck by a British. I think it was a grain container liner or something of that nature. And um, I think that shook him badly, as it would, because he was all these hours in a lifeboat. He survived, but mm. that, that was another reason. Uh, but I think the, the most common uh, description of his illness was uh, schizophrenia, which, of course, symptoms of that, as I understand it, are things like hallucinations or imagining that maybe people are out to get you, and he definitely had an element to that. But all that, or aside from all of that, it always struck me in reading about him that he had a relatively peaceful existence in the sanatorium. It wasn't, he was able to get out. It wasn't as if he was being locked away there. It was a quite liberal establishment uh, insofar as any of these places can be, I guess. He was able to get out and play golf. His sisters would come and collect him. He was a devout Roman Catholic. That was very, very strong uh, throughout his career. They would collect him, take him to Mass on Sundays. So a very complex guy. You know, some 
strange parts to his personality, but also some generous and kind parts as well. So that's that more or less the picture. Was that there was any history? Yeah, was there any history of uh, schizophrenia or mental health issues in his family before this that's documented? That, that much, I, that much, I, I, I never came across anything to suggest that. I know his mother uh -huh. looked after him. She was the one who put him to the, the sanatorium. He was well looked. He had good family. Um, but I don't think there was any history. Certainly sisters seemed to be, uh, one was a unmarried, one was a married and was a widow. Though I don't think there was anything of that nature at all. And there's certainly no record of that I came across. But he spent 55 years institutionalized. Yes, 55 wow. years institutionalized. This was and at one stage the top golfer, you know, and there we are. It's, it's an amazing story um, and the kind of story that is important today. I, I think it's it really great that you, you're bringing this out now um, and hopefully somebody um, will recognize it. Maybe we'll get to see the movie someday. Oh, I, I doubt it very much, but it would be nice. But it's just lovely to, uh, to have done it, and it's lovely to get the chance to talk about it, because I think it is an important story, because we tend, as you were alluding to earlier on, golf now, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, massive, massive amounts of money, massive amounts of fame and fortune and everything else. And, you know, two Open Championships in a row, U.S. Open Championships in a row, that's at 19 and 20 years old. That's take some doing. And then this sadness. Well, it... Yeah, it's remarkable just in that sense alone. But the fact that he was the first one ever to do it, that first nobody American. else had ever. Yeah, no, no was, American nor more uh, American he, born. He was the first uh, homebred to do it. And the newspapers made a great deal. They were so, as I said, they, they had this mixed relationship with him. And while they would be critical in the report and the fact that maybe he said something he shouldn't have said, which he did on more than one occasion, but they would say, you know, the homebred caddy boy beats the, the invaders and beats the whoever else it is, the, the foreign imports and so on. They were, they were quite proud of that, on the other hand, as well. And he did it. Fascinating story. Yeah. Fascinating story. Kevin, I really appreciate your time. Again, let's go over your books. I'm going to give you the titles. And these are all available on Amazon, I'm hoping? On Amazon, yes, indeed, yeah. Uh, the, the Fabulous. American, well, the book American. we're talking about is... Go Golf's Forgotten Hero, The Life of John McDermott. Yeah. Then there's also... Uh, the, the life story of Ralph Guldall, twice U.S. Open champion. Uh, right. the life Ralph story. Guldall is G-U-L-D-A-H-L, and it's the rise Patty. and fall of world's greatest golfer. That's right, exactly. Uh, and Patty Berg, pioneer champion of women's golf. And American golf in the Great Depression. Um, so... Um, that, that's the, the first one I wrote. That basically charts how the how the tour grew paradoxically in the Great Depression when so much else was going or was difficult in American society, but professional golf got off the ground really in the nineteen thirties. So that's yeah. the, that book. Yes, yeah. I'm fascinated by that one. Absolutely, American golf in, in the, the Great, Great Depression. The pros take to the grapefruit circuit. Grapefruit circuit. That's what the, the, a lot of the swing was down in Florida in the, among the palm trees and the orange trees and all the rest of it. Yep. Mm. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing this story with us and for writing the story. It's a great read, and it's a great read right at this time of year. Lovely talking to you, Fred. Thanks to Rich Weil from Summers, New York, who introduced today's episode and actually has been sending me a lot of really compelling emails regarding what he's been learning on Golf Smarter. And today I'm doing an interview for an upcoming episode with instructor Eric Scholberg to address his latest question in regards to what are we thinking about when we make our swing? When I addressed Eric, he's like, I am so into that topic. Let's do it. And you'll be hearing that in the next couple of weeks. And as we learned last week, you too can become a Golf Smarter Ambassador and introduce an upcoming episode. And for your effort, you'll receive a glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com, where you can choose from 11 styles of gloves in 26 sizes so that they fit you properly. We thank RedRoosterGolf.com for giving a new glove to every Golf Smarter ambassador who joins us. And I invite you to also do the same just for leaving a voicemail. 
Write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and let me know that you'd like to do an episode intro and I'll send you some simple instructions. Now, as for today's conversation, you may not realize this, but as of yet, John McDermott has not been inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. Many of the greats have been honored globally, and even Bing Crosby and Bob Hope have been inducted for their contributions to sponsoring golf tournaments. But the man who was the first homebred to win the U.S. Open has been overlooked so far. And considering the forgotten status of John McDermott, it isn't surprising. Again, the book, Golf's Forgotten Hero, The Life of John McDermott, is available on Amazon, written by Kevin Kenney, our guest today. I'll leave a link in today's show notes. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes or ideas for episodes, please click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.